Like the fabled goose that laid the golden egg, federally funded scientific research has yielded extraordinary yet unexpected returns. Out of odd sounding, obscure beginnings have come many amazing advances that have improved each of our lives. The Golden Goose Award recognizes the people and the stories behind these unexpected and incredible scientific breakthroughs. Well, I finally decided to use the word fuzzy, meaning unsharp. But I knew very well that it's the kind of word that will give some trouble. And indeed, it did. Most people think that if you write down a mathematical formula, it's either true or false. And in Latvi's paper, he said, no, that's not necessarily the case. People started understanding that what people want out of objects that they interact with in everyday life, be they subway trains or rice cookers or cameras, are really not expressed in numerical terms. The basic premise was different. It was fuzzy, it wasn't zero, one, but it was all the numbers in between zero, one. So imagine you want to have a concept like a tall man. We would all agree that someone who's four feet tall is short, and we would all agree that someone who's eight feet tall is tall, but what about someone who's six feet tall? That's not necessarily either true or false, zero or one. And so that's what's called fuzzy. It's something is not exactly true or false. Now, once you get away from zeros and ones, then all the rules of logic that we've used since Aristotle go away. How you get those distributions was the profound difference between what Latvi perceived and what the rest of the statistical community believed and still believes. Senator Proxmire, he was going to give me Golden Fleece Award. <laughs> this award was given to people and receiving taxpayer support for something that didn't make any sense. <laughs> so I finally persuaded Senator Proxmire not to give this award to me, but this was pretty close. Some of the backlash is, I think, really the method of science. When there is a change in paradigm, you know, there is uh, resistance, there is animated debate. He really was in odds with all the mathematically minded people who said, well, why do you need this new measure when you have a standard probability theory. I think the big breakthrough came out in consumer electronics. Your braking system, you know, your washing machine, consumer devices, you name it, they all have this kind of logic built in to help interact with the users. The federal research that went into Latvi thinking about fuzzy logic has spawned a gigantic industry, has spawned a gigantic academic community. And now, of course, AI is in another, you know, golden era when everybody is, you know, asking themselves, how do we, or is everything going to change because of that? And Latvi was one of the early pioneers in that. You really cannot predict what the discovery will be five to ten years. And that is the critical thing. And I think in terms of an ROI, it is really quite spectacular. So this will be the fun part of today. Unless you've seen a hardwood plywood panel, you, you probably wouldn't recognize one. What you do recognize, though, are cabinet doors, the sides of cabinets, the sides of furniture. All that is, is quite often uh, hardwood plywood, just converted into a finished good. Formaldehyde was becoming a bigger and bigger 
tissue. You was just showing up in more studies, more cancer studies. This was presented as a, as a solution that could replace all of the formaldehyde-based adhesives in our company. So you look at all this, they just stick there. So show me. <laughs> I don't think I can get this one up. A friend of mine said, let me show you the Bay Area. There's a lot of muscle. You drop down here and show me the, this place. As you can see, the, all the muscles stick together. Really thick layer the muscles stick together. As a chemist, I always say, this is amazing. How can they develop something that can stick to the dirty wet surface? So I, I went back to check the literature. It, it figured, somebody read down the research and said, oh, they figured out this uh, muscle produce a protein had this unique, so it's a unique uh, amino acid composition. How can I utilize this extraordinary ability to develop uh, uh, adhesive? Then one day I was eating lunch, I suddenly realized that soy meal has about 50% protein. Now protein is protein, they all consist of amino acid, but it has different composition. So at that time I thought, can I convert the soy protein into uh, excellent adhesive this way? That's how we got started. That's how we got the funding from the uh, USDA. It's a, it was a long process. We, we published more than 30 papers. We found that use a Western agent, just mixing with soy and water. And during the making the uh, plywood, it make the adhesive very water resistant. I, I gave a, uh, a presentation and I basically described this novel adhesive system. And after the presentation, I couldn't help but think he was talking directly to us, directly to our company, because this is what we've been looking for, for for years. So we struck up a conversation immediately after that meeting. And before we left that conference, we had already settled on an agreement to pursue commercialization with them. We worked in the lab for a while just to get an understanding of what we think it's going to take to take it to one of our factories and, and try it. We had built a portable mixing system and that went on for probably three, four months. And we went to the factory the first time and, and it was a disaster. Every, nothing worked. <laughs> but it, it was a learning experience. It was the first, so we looked at all, all the things that didn't work well. We take that back to the lab and we work on it again and we come back to the mill again. We started converting our mills in 2005. Now we estimate that over 60% of all plywood made in America uh, uses a soy-based resin as its uh, bonding agent. It had so many benefits that were beyond just the product. We could provide a better work environment for the employees, a better community environment around our mills, and provide our customers with a product that's healthier as well. I enjoy what I did, so I enjoy working, so, uh, but I never thought it has such a big impact. The impact is really, really big from this kind of work, and those federal dollars come in and they provide the seed money and actually let it grow more and more and more to be something where then everyone says, boy, we needed that and we didn't even know it could exist. We started to see this organism within the skin, and we weren't really sure what it was. The populations crash so rapidly and so dramatically, you have the potential to lose entire wildlife species. Losing that diversity, I just think the world becomes literally a less colorful place. The outbreak started in the fall of 96. We started to have deaths of these blue poison dart frogs within the collection. And this very distinctive skin disease, it appeared to be caused by some microscopic organisms. They looked like they were probably organisms that are called chytridiomycetes. And there weren't too many people in the whole world that were experts on chytridiomycetes. I've been here since about 1985. 
I was the full-time stay-at-home mother. An NSF grant got me back into Kittred work. As a child, we lived on a farm. My favorite activities were going down to the creek and catching fish. Finding Kittreds is like going fishing. She was one of maybe three people in the world who could really tell you what kind of organism this was, and one of the few people who really cared, I think, about this group of organisms. At the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., the poison dart frogs started to die. If something dies at a zoo, you have to find out why. They knew if I could isolate disease from the frogs, it was a way to diagnose that's what these frogs had. It was a Sunday, I think, I came in, and I looked at that bottle and it's either there's bacteria growing in there or that fungus has grown. I've found one of the most exciting things I could think about. This seemed to be a new disease of amphibians. She contacted us quite excited and said, yeah, this is something new. This could be a kind of a big deal. But it wasn't just happening here, it was happening all over the world. There were populations in the wild that were mysteriously disappearing. Coming to Panama for the first time, there were so many frogs. The noise is crazy out in the forest. Comparing that at a site where the chytrid had hit, the comparative quiet is devastating because the thrill I get from picking up these frogs and playing with toads that I've had from when I was really small, to imagine that there are going to be other kids that don't have that opportunity makes me really sad. I grew up in a rural area. I would just spend hours playing in the creek and catching frogs, catching tadpoles. I've always liked the creepy crawly kind of things. Biodiversity, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. Lose a piece of the puzzle, the picture's not whole anymore. We humans are stewards of the earth. It's important for us to maintain biodiversity in these rich and different environments, mostly because we don't even understand it ourselves. We don't know what secrets are out there. The story of Joyce Longcore working away just for science's sake, Overnight, she goes from just this into a scientific rock star and making this really important contribution to saving amphibian species globally. I was content to study a group nobody has much interest in. I still am content to do that work. Without federal funding, we never would have been able to do any of this. Science begins and happens because of federal funding. Not only does it allow us to answer difficult questions that the private sector might ignore, but it also allows us to do so for a long period of time. Federal funding is the, the baseline for so many research projects. If we have that baseline project getting started with federal funding, we can add on all the parts that make it into this big, likely successful research initiative that can take years or decades to complete or to see the fruits of that labor. A fundamental national strength is our ability to really invest across several fields rather than investing in specific outcomes. Research often begins with just curiosity. The return to investment for the American taxpayer has been gigantic. Some of it will just be beautiful, pure science and pure mathematics, but if you don't make that investment, then huge payoffs may not occur. You never know when something that is found will become important.